you actually could fuse directly to the PCF. And the advantage of that was that uh, the very first result we took, the, this was pumped with an average power of about 10 watts. So the super continuum was in the 4 to 5 watt, 6 watts. It's fully fiber integrated. You can power scale it to whatever you want. You can obtain greater than 100 milliwatts per nanometer. So from the super continuum, you can actually select one nanometer and you'll have 100 milliwatts average power. You can control the wavelength, of course, you can pump this with any fiber laser you want, erbium, ytterbium, thulium, depending on the range you want to be in or what you want to do. And you have precise control of everything through the PCF and through the, through the pulse durations. High average power super continuum wasn't really new. Um, a bulk couple system we had developed uh, in about 1986, uh, and this was simply a Raman super continuum. And as you can see, uh, it's, this is the pump pulse here, about 1.3. It's a YAG system. It, it evolves some modulation instability. So this is the short wavelength side of the modulation instability. And the modulation instability band turns into solitons, gets amplified from the pump, and you get this generated continuum from which you can select pulses. You can move a filter around this and select pulses of about 80 femtoseconds duration or shorter. Uh, but the thing is, lens coupled and there was nothing to the short wavelength side. Similarly, uh, in the compact package that I mentioned in on Monday night, um, similar sort of performance, but now it's getting a lot smaller. Everything's fully integrated. This is the complete thing, diode. Erbium, or ytterbium fiber laser system and the fiber for the super continuum and then it's just coupled out just to show you what can happen. And, and this one could be frequency doubled in a, an external crystal. Once again, it, it was beyond the zero dispersion of, a, of, a, of a, the fiber. You know, it's a normal fiber. So you just get this cascade of Raman orders, then the super continuum. So you won't get any four-wave mixing really that's efficiently uh, matched into the visible. So once again, it's not that attractive in terms of a source. The big thing, of course, in all of this is the actual power scaling and the use of fiber lasers to pump so that you can integrate with the output of the fiber laser. Now, if you look at a basic fiber laser, you'll have the active fiber here, single mode. So you pump this through a, a wavelength division multiplex coupler, single mode diode here pumping into the single mode and you have your reflectors here that determine your laser. Since this is single mode, probably the most you can get in from a pump is roughly 100 milliwatts, something like that. And the most you can then do is you can put two of them in. So you aren't really going to scale this single mode fiber to very high power. Uh, if you're only going to pump with about 200 milliwatts, you aren't going to get a watt out, that's for sure. Of course, you can use polarization, so you can polarization multiplex and increase the, the power by a factor of two, but that's it. That's the end of it. So with end pumping, or, uh, as you have here, you really you need diffraction limited sources, so you're limited in the power that you can get in and the power clearly then that you can get out. What changes everything is the concept of the double cloud fiber which is here. So you have your active core here. You have an outer cladding into which you can pump using a broad, a broad stripe diode. And this goes into the outer cladding and bounces around. The outer cladding, of course, is a, a third cladding out here, uh, which gives you your guidance. And this bounces around, excites the center core. You get gain, and the thing will lay in single mode. So this is a mode converter. So you can pump with multiple diodes, and these can be coupled through a multi-mode device. You can put as many of these in as you want, uh, and this means that you can scale these up to huge powers. And just to give an example, the biggest power at the moment, the greatest power at the moment, from a single mode, right, single mode device is 10 kilowatts, CW. 10 kilowatts from a single mode output. And that's just scaled using this double clan type geometry. <clears throat> Basically, you pump in through these multi-mode couplers and in excite this core. 
So this is the thing that's given the, the big advantage. Now, there can be problems, uh, I do admit. And this is, this is actually a little demonstration that uh, uh, we took. And this is simply putting one, uh, roughly one and a half watts into a single mode fiber. And this, the single mode fiber has a little micro bend at the end of it. Um, and in this movie, oh, pardon me, we're pumping from this end, okay? So have a look and see what happens. <clears throat> And that's a little plasma that you've generated in the fiber. <clears throat> and it's generated here, and then just simply works its way backwards towards the pump source. Uh, and that's it on a macroscopic scale. If you take a microscope there and look into the fiber and see what happens, this is your backward propagating plasma. And you can see that it's sort of definitely melted and it leaves this little periodic structure behind it as essentially it creates a plasma the plasma expands it blows out oxygen from the from the uh, from this core of the fiber collapses again starts again just works its way back and uh, it's a heat heat it actually heat actually is the process that initiates this and it totally destroys the fiber <clears throat> And in fact, if you let it go, it will keep on going back and destroy the pump downs as well. Uh, and so this is a serious problem in high, high power systems. Uh, so you can imagine if you're operating them at tens of kilowatts, this could be, a, could be a real problem. So you have to be very careful about that. And this is a so-called fiber fuse. Actually, next week, Raman Kashup will be here, uh, who's one of the guys who reported this first. And I, I do believe Anderson's here next week, is it? No? No? Well, someone should ask Anderson Gomez when the first fiber fuse was seen. It actually predates this by a year. Okay, so the concept that actually um, really drives fiber laser forwards is this idea of the master oscillator power fiber amplifier. And it's a very simple idea. If you have a really efficient amplifier, the worst thing you can do is turn it into a laser. You don't want to turn it into a laser that's just operating on threshold. You want to be pulling everything out of this that you, you, you can get. So take a little simple seed source. It doesn't matter if it's inefficient, and this will extract everything for you. So the master oscillator can be anything you want, diode laser, fiber laser. You can control the parameters of this, CW, pulse, nanosecond, picosecond, directly modulate a diode or whatever, and then just extract the gain. This is a normal, give you the fiber laser, or the fiber amplifier will give you enormous single pass gain, 30, 40 dB. Uh, it's enormously wavelength diverse, ytterbium, erbium, thulium, ramen. Uh, it has reasonable energy storage. It won't compete, for example, with neodymium YAG or anything like that, but it has high, high energy storage. But the big advantage is that the whole thing is totally fiber integrated and it's very, very stable. And so you can generate cascades simply uh, using a, a picosecond laser, seeding a, a, a main amplifier. And you can see here in this example that I'm showing you, this is just a, mo a very basic mode lock laser. I'll maybe mention that later, how, they, the, how they're operating. A few picoseconds, eight picoseconds. But here you can see that one of the limitations, even in the amplifier, is that by the time you're generating quite high 10, 15 watts average power, and this, this is really a, a, um, it's called a large mode amplifier, but it's only about 12, 13 microns. Uh, you can see that you're generating a Raman signal. And this is the Raman signal. Now, that means that power is being removed from the pump, uh, so that's not a really a good idea. Uh, it's no problem if you're looking simply for super continuum generation. You just simply have essentially two pumps then. Uh, but for, uh, if, for any other application, you really don't want nonlinearity in your amplifiers. So you, in that case, you actually have to make larger mode area amplifiers so that the power density is lower. And there's lots of work on that. Lots of pe people have done lots of work. And also you can use uh, external techniques of, for example, chirp pulse amplifiers, which I'll maybe mention as well in fiber. 
<clears throat> so if you look at this applied to super continuum, it's a very simple system, 10 watts, two picoseconds, 60 kilowatts peak power, just fiber coupled into a PCF. And this is essentially the phase matching curve. And this is actually the, the, the spectrum of the first super continuum taken in 2004 with about four watts average power in the super continuum. And one of the things you notice is that the pump is depleted quite, quite severely. You have extension into the, the visible region extension up into the mid-infrared, but it doesn't really go beyond 600 nanometers. And as this was scaled up over the years, uh, 50 watts pumping, 50, or 50 watts actually in the super continuum, it was exactly the same spectrum. Nothing changed. So you would have thought, hey, there's something funny happening here. Why is this happening? You know, uh, you would think I'm putting in, you know, an order of magnitude more power, so it's nonlinear optics, you should have more spectrum generated. <clears throat> and the reason for that is, if you look, for example, here, and the first idea was to look, say, what's happening maybe in four-wave mixing. So if you look at this fiber, it had a zero dispersion just above a micron, and this is the phase matching curve. And you can see that as you would pump this, say, around a micron, uh, you'll generate this sort of wavelength around 1.5, and the corresponding about 700, something like that. And as the super, uh, super continuum would sort of evolve in this, you'll have all these pump wavelengths. So you would have pump wavelengths say, around 0.95, and it would be pumping, trying, trying to generate phase matching between signals around two microns and about 600. But the big problem is this is a silica-based fiber. And beyond about two microns, you've high loss, and you've no guide. So in actual fact, this is the reason why it won't go any further. It, after about two microns is generated, it, it phase matches with roughly about 600 nanometers, and it simply won't go any further because this is lossy, and this doesn't allow phase matching to occur. So we thought, ah, the simple way around that is that we'll cascade it. So we put the first system as it was, this is the original fiber. And now we actually inserted a second fiber. And so you would pump this around a micron, and it would generate the super continuum. And the super continuum would evolve. And as the super continuum evolved, then the short wavelength side of this now begins to pump this second fiber, which has a zero dispersion around 700. So this fiber can phase match between 200, 2,000 nanometers, and below 500 nanometers. So the expectation was that this super continuum would pump this fiber and generate shorter wavelengths. <clears throat> and what we noticed was that in the first fiber, as soon as the, uh, the wavelength in the first fiber, which is HF104, as soon as it reached the zero dispersion of the second fiber, which is this point here, you simply had this enormous jump in the wavelength of the generated short wavelength side. And this would continue. So clearly it was working. <clears throat> and this is the super continuum generator. So we then thought, hey, the easier way is actually to just have it continuous so that this happens at all wavelengths. So rather than we thought, well, if we could case, cascade, start with the first and cascade another, 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 and put in maybe like six fibers, and this would allow us to cascade down. And of course it would, but you, you would have joining losses between each of those fibers. So the simple way then is actually just pull a tapered fiber. So in actual fact, as you pull the, the fiber, make the core narrower, all you do is you shift the zero dispersion. All you do is shift this phase matching curve. So. Um, we got the group in Bath actually to, to make us a, a tapered fiber. And of course, I wouldn't be standing here telling you about it if it didn't work. And of course, it did work. And it went down to well below 400 nanometers. <clears throat> and this is the tapered fiber that was made by the Bath group. It was made directly at the, at the drawing tower. Um, it had a, a diameter and pitch which was constant. So all they did was just pull at a varying rate and essentially the holes and everything maintained its structure and tapered down. 
And long lengths of this are, are possible since it's made at the drawing car. And this is actually the dispersion profile uh, of this device. This is at the input side where you have the zero dispersion around a micron. So you're pumping here just above a micron with your uh, 1.06 laser. Uh, and this is in the anomalous regime. And then as you propagate down the fiber, you can see the zero shifts, the shorter wavelengths. And as it gets very small in diameter, this fiber, of course, you get these complicated uh, double zero type structures. So we modeled the dynamics of it <coughs> uh, to see what was happening. And this explains uh, actually what's happening. So this is simply looking at the fiber after about 25 centimeters. And you go in, uh, originally there was a nice clean single pulse going in. After 25 centimeters, you begin to see the process of modulation instability this sort of solitonic driven four-wave mixing that happens close to the dispersion zero. So you have the pump radiation and the soliton or the modulational instability sidebands. And the spectrum looks like this. This is a single shot essentially, so it's very noisy. And the modulational instability essentially is noise driven and breaks up this pulse into little short, high intense pulses. Kilowatt type pulses evolve on the back end of this pulse. After 35 centimeters, you can see there's an evolution and you get a cascade of four-wave mixing. And so this begins to, to broaden. You can see broadening into about 1.6, 1.7 here and extending to about 500 nanometers. And you're now beginning to see a super continuum evolving over this spectral range. And this is the strange sort of phase, phase matching curves. This is at the input after about one meter. And this is after nine meters. Because of the double zero structure, you get a very complicated four-way mixing um, uh, arrangement. But the interesting thing is that from the four-way mixing and the phase matching diagrams, the short wavelength limit is just below 500 nanometers. We were generating actually down to 320 nanometers. So what was the reason for that? Uh, you, and this clearly shows experimentally that uh, uh, as we went along the tapered length, the wavelength of that was evolving definitely around 300, 320 nanometers. Well, the further extension is actually explained by another process. And the process of this soliton dispersive wave interaction. And if you look at this, this is the, the, the simulation of the spectrum after about half a meter. Uh, this is your original pump wavelength. You can see the remnant of the pump still remaining there. And if you look into the wings, you can see these little bright spots. And these are the solitons that are bleeding off this very high power pump. And the solitons are evolving from these modul modulational instability profiles, the, the noise-driven process. These are the spiky bits here. These are all these intense solitons. If you look into the normal dispersion regime, you can see like a structure in the normal dispersion regime. And there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. This with this, this with this, this with this here. But these are dispersive waves but you can see a structure within them. And <clears throat> this is actually explained by the process of cross-phase modulation. And if you think of this, it, it, if you think you have your soliton in the region of the zero dispersion. So it's a short pulse, and it's evolved somewhere near the zero dispersion. So as it evolves there, it, begin, it begins to broaden in wavelength. And Bits of it are in the anomalous bit, and little bits of it then leach into the normal dispersion regime. So you'd expect it to woof, shoot, shoot away with dispersion. So you're left with a soliton and a little dispersive wave, and they're straddling the zero dispersion. So what happens is that this is a very intense pulse, and this should actually impose a self. It, it's, modulating the index. So if you think of its self-phase modulation,
profile. The front end of the silicon uh, normally is going to impress a very strong red shift, and the back end a blue shift due to that self phase modulation, which remember the problem yesterday. The front end's red, the back end's blue. And this impresses on the dispersive wave then. So it modulates the index for the weak dispersive wave. So the weak dispersive wave becomes red in the front, blue in the back. Now the dispersive wave is in the normal dispersion regime. So what does it do? The front end of it travels faster. The back end of it travels slower, essentially. So it's as if the front end moves away, the back end moves backwards. But remember, the soliton is a short pulse soliton. It's in the anomalous dispersion regime. So what's it going to do? It's going to exhibit the soliton self-frequency shift. So it moves to longer wavelengths. Yeah? But in the anomalous dispersion regime, red actually travels slower than blue. So the soliton's going to fall backwards. So what happens is the soliton falls backwards. A little bit of the dispersive wave moves forwards and is lost. But what happens is the blue bit and the main bit of this, it falls backwards, gets trapped by the soliton, and they just simply track the whole time. As this soliton moves away off into the distance through soliton self-frequency shift, it traps the blue end and pulls it with it. Only it pulls it into the blue. So this pulls into the red and pulls this little bit here with it into the blue. And basically, it's spectrally, they just go like that with distance. Now, <clears throat> that's a hard process, actually, to group velocity match if you have a single fiber. So think of it. This is the group velocity here. And this is the profile you would get, say, at the input. So if you have a standard fiber, you don't have any of these here because this is due to the taper. You can really only group velocity match at one wavelength, say this wavelength and that one. Uh, if you change, if you go, change the soliton cell frequency shift, it changes to here and matches with that one. But now in the taper, essentially you have a continuum that can that can actually group velocity match with everything. So the taper is really going to enhance this pulling of the short wave. So to do that. And to demonstrate it, I just have a model here that was developed by John Travers in our group. And this shows the enhancement of, uh, and the trapping in standard PCF. So this is just a standard PCF, no taper. And what you can see is you launch a soliton. And, you, and, and for the sake of the model, we launched a little dispersive wave that was sitting here at 800 nanometers and the soliton here around 1.3. And this is the soliton spectrum, and this is the dispersive wave. And this is at the input. <clears throat> After about 30 centimeters here, you can see that the soliton is moving away, shedding off a little bit of radiation. But this, is, this shift in wavelength is due to this, the soliton self-frequency shift. And you can see that the dispersive wave is pulled with it. It's tracking with it. Further on down the fiber, you still have this nice short soliton, little bits of dispersive wave here, but it's still pulling the dispersive wave with it. And it's pulling it out now to start at 800 nanometers, it's now pulled it to 600 nanometers. So it pulls it into the visible. Now the good thing about modeling is that you can actually turn off your model. When you put this in the fiber, you can't change the physical process. So experimentally, you can't do this, but if you Put it into a, a, a standard PCF and say, turn off the Raman gain. And you can do that. What you can see is that you really need the Raman gain because it's the Raman gain that actually deaccelerates de your soliton, slows it up, and gives this, this group velocity match. So same again, launch at the input. Now you can see that the soliton here is not really moving because the, there's no Raman gain. You go to the soliton cell frequency shift. You can see that the actual dispersive wave is now dispersing. It's moving away. The soliton basically stays as it is. There's little bits dispersing off that as it travels uh, down the fiber. But the dispersive wave 
doesn't move at all spectrally, and does as, does as it says on the packet, disperses, it moves away. So you need the Raman, you need the Raman uh, in, in the standard fiber. So what happens with tapers? Well, tapers actually enhance that two ways. You get group velocity matching, and you get soliton enhancement. And I, I hate to bore people because these simulations don't get sort of, they get a bit boring, they get a bit semi, don't they? It's, you know, it's a bit like looking at modern art and a lot of modern art, and you think, oh my God, it's the same thing again, only a different color. Uh, <coughs> um, um, and it's the same here, but this is now the tapered fiber. So now we're putting it in the tapered fiber, and theoretically, or modeling, we've turned off the ramen, so there's no ramen there. All we're doing is looking at the taper, what the taper do. So we launch it, and you can see 1.3, 800, launch again. And now you can see that the soliton's more or less sitting there. He's not doing an awful lot. But look, because of the taper, it's, this, this can move away, and it matches with this, and it's held to it. So the, the, the ram and gain is actually, or the soliton's actually through cross-phase modulation, pulling this with it as it moves down the fiber. Similarly here, is, of course, there's, as I say again, there's dispersive waves flying off this, but the dispersive wave now has moved to 500. This is still sort of sitting in the region of 1300 where it was launched, still a nice soliton, and the dispersive wave is held with it. So it's these dispersive waves that are pulled. And this is, this is a super advantage because in actual fact, it allows you then to pull down to about 300 nanometers. The shortest, I think the shortest that's been achieved is the, the, our work with Bath, which is 320 nanometers. The big problem, of course, is that as you begin to generate UV in glass, it's not really a good thing to do, right? <laughs> uh, and in fact, if you wanted to commercialize this, you would need to be very, very careful. You're probably your glass system would be going back to be replaced because you're going to generate color centers and defects in the glass. So although this demonstrates that this works, it's really, really not a good idea to do it, okay? Uh, so as, as Philip said, don't do this at home. You know, don't do this in the lab, really. Um, th this, you know, you'll get multi-photon problems and, and, and you'll just ionize your, your glass. Uh, but it allows you to generate UV um, and this, this is reasonably stable for moderate times. Uh, th this won't probably last a year, that's for sure. This definitely won't do that. Uh, it won't last a year of continual use. You, intermittently, it'll last a year, no problem. <clears throat> but of course, you know, there, there are plenty of sort of smart guys around and the guys uh, at Bath, uh, after you know, we had talked with them, they realized, well, in fact, this can be done uh, actually easier and really, in a way, they, they took a very simple approach to it. Um, this was really the material dispersion. As you can see, the material dispersion in the short wavelength side is, is dominated by the, you know, it, it, that dominates the material dispersion. But here, it's the waveguide that changes things. And, and this is uh, the so-called endlessly single mode, essentially a standard PCF. And this would be, uh, <coughs> pardon me, the sort of super continuum you, you'd get from it. It doesn't go down to the UV simply because of this sort of phase matching or group velocity matching, I mean, between the extended end here to the infrared and what you get uh, to the short wavelength side. So if you can actually pull the group velocity dispersion up, and you can change the dispersion of this, uh, you could simply, you can see really from that that uh, in this case, this, uh, say, for example, 400 is going to be phase matched or group velocity matched at 220, whereas in the endlessly single mode one, 400 is going to be group velocity matched by about 2.8 or something like that. Now, 2.8 isn't going to propagate, uh, but the 2.2 .2 or whatever it is. So <clears throat> you can see that this, this is actually just what you would get if you had a single strand of glass in air, a five micron strand. And so they made something that almost was that. Uh, essentially, they made a system where they had much, much bigger air holes. The air dominated. And they got something that sort of more or less resembled a five micron strand in air. And this allowed them then to get down to about 350 with just a single standard shaped uh, PCF. 
Okay, well, that's pulsed uh, uh, supercontinuum. The other question is, well, can you, can you generate supercontinuum with a CW laser? Well, uh, uh, and really the, 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 the interest in that is to really make cheap white light sources, uh, particularly for illumination or whatever. Uh, the big problem is that you can't really, and also to increase the average power, um, you couldn't really do that with a femtosecond system. If you increase the average power up to 100 watts, or say for pumping with a femtosecond system, um, you're simply going to have too high energy in the pulse, and it's going to damage the fibers. So long pulses or CW pump, um, pumping gives you the way to scale the power. And as you know, nonlinearity is just power and length. So if, you would think that if femtoseconds do it in, in a centimeter, CW laser uh, of a few tens of watts is going to do it in tens or hundreds of meters. But the question is, is that what are, what, what's really the formation mechanism from a CW laser? Well, is it, this is simply just looking at uh, supercontinuum generation with continuous lasers, uh, actually in a, in, in a highly nonlinear fiber. It's not even a PCF. And this is uh, simply using a, a Raman. Uh, tunable fiber laser, and looking at what happens uh, with, with modest powers, about 1.82 watts. And this is the zero dispersion, and as you tune this Raman laser, you can see the zero dispersion of this fiber is at 1.457. So this is now pumping at 1.45, so it's the normal dispersion regime. So you see the pump, and what it does is it generates the next Stokes at 1.55, and only from that do you get this soliton Raman continuum. As you scan this and tune the laser, you can see that as you begin to hit around the zero dispersion with your pump wavelength, the supercontinuum actually evolves then from that. So it's around the zero dispersion that uh, uh, is the dynamic that causes the, the evolution of, of the supercontinuum. And of course, we know that it's modulational instability. And if you look at this, you can see that with a fairly simple, just in, this is an ASE source amplified up to 10 watts in the highly nonlinear fiber. You have a relatively, and this is time integrated, there's a very flat supercontinuum, but it extends to the short wavelength side and to the long wavelength side. The thing you've got to think about is, does actually the, the line width of this source affect the supercontinuum? Because really, what is, the, what, is, what is the process that's generating it? If you had a truly CW system, single frequency, and you looked at that in time, there's going to be no fluctuations on it. But if you have a, a source that's an ASE source or a broad source in CW, you're going to have mode beating. And if you take a snapshot of that, it's just going to look like random noise. And in the time domain, the, inver the time duration of that is just simply going to be the inverse of the bandwidth. So you would think if you have a CW system, the bigger the bandwidth you have, the shorter the pulse durations are going to be in this fluctuation. And it's this fluctuation that seeds, essentially, or acts as the seed for the modulational instability. So you would think, hey, that's maybe going to affect it. So if you take a one kilometer system and you change the bandwidth here, and the bandwidth of the pump system now is changing over two orders of magnitude from a tenth of a nanometer to 10 nanometers, you can see that in the, and this is simply the width of the supercontinuum, as you go to very short, narrow bandwidths and very broad bandwidths, the actual supercontinuum rolls off. And exactly the same is true if you go to short wavelengths or short lengths of fiber. Uh, for very narrow bandwidths, you essentially get narrow supercontinuum. As you broaden the bandwidth, the supercontinuum broadens, reaches the maximum, and after that, if you increase the bandwidth, the supercontinuum begins then to get narrower again. So what's happening? <clears throat> the reason that it happens is, is that you're sort of, uh, uh, well, oh, sort of explain that first, I suppose. The reason for that is that if you have a very, very narrow bandwidth, this is going to give rise to sort of noise spikes that are going to try and seed the solitons in the system. 
Very narrow ones means that you have very short solitons. Very short solitons mean that you require very high power. So the very narrow bandwidths aren't going to really be able to generate solitons because you don't have enough power in them. So if you can't generate, generate the solitons, they aren't going to generate the supercontinuum. Okay? Likewise, if you have very broad bandwidths, then the fluctuations are very long in time. Sorry, if you have very narrow bandwidths, you have very long fluctuations in time. If you have a very long fluctuation in time, you actually need quite low soliton energy. You don't really, really need a lot of energy you know, to generate a soliton for a long pulse. But the big problem is you need a very, very long length. The soliton length, remember, the nonlinear length scales with the square of that. So in actual fact, you need very, very long fibers before you can generate solitons. And so 50 nanometer, 50 meters, one kilometer is not going to be enough to generate these long, long solitons. So you don't get no soliton dynamics, so you get no supercontinuum. So that's basically it. So you can scale these CW systems. Uh, and this is a system uh, scale here, pumping with about 50 watts average power. And this gives you about 100 milliwatts per nanometer within the supercontinuum. But the big problem in, with this system that we used this for, once again, no short wavelength uh, excursion. And you can see the reason for that. The reason is that um, this fiber here had a zero dispersion at about uh, 830. So it's this red line, you're pumping at a micron, you're too far away, so you can't generate you know, efficient modulation and stability, you can't generate solitons from that. And all you do is you generate a, a Raman signal and soliton Raman from it. Uh, so you won't get this sort of pooling of the solitons around the zero dispersion and the dispersive waves generate it. <coughs> and you can, this simply just shows you the same again, and the explanation of narrow pump spectrum, the noise structures are too long, broad spectrum, the noise structures are short, so you need high power, and this sort of explains the system. So this is a little model uh, also then that we've sort of uh, developed uh, to show the evolution of uh, the supercontinuum from CW pumping. And this is essentially um, what a a CW laser will sort of look like. Um, it's just going to be this huge noise. It's a noise structure. Uh, it's a quite a broad, reasonably broad bandwidth. And what happens in that is you can see that the system begins to evolve. Oh. The system begins uh, to, to, to evolve. I'll, I'll actually just talk through it. The system evolves, you have this, the soliton, this is like one of these rogue waves. This is the soliton self-frequency shift. It hits the zero dispersion, sheds off a dispersive wave, and it flies away. Meanwhile, all these solitons are beginning to just feed off. It's just like a, a soliton rain. It's just woof. You know, it's just firing off of these little solitons that are getting amplified through Raman-type process, modulation instability. And you can see the solitons stack up at the zero dispersion. They just sort of sit there. They can't go any further because the solitons won't go into the normal dispersion regime. And of course, their dispersive waves do, and they sort of disperse away and still sort of get held in the tails. You get no sort of pulling in this regime because you don't have the grip velocity matching. And this is what it looks like. just. Whereas if you look at the process in the region of the zero dispersion and you pump in the region of the zero dispersion, uh, what happens is that you can see that you have your original, you're pumping here at 105, or pumping at 106, the zero dispersion is at 105, so you're very, very close to the zero dispersion. And so the solitons that evolve actually develop these little dispersive waves across the zero in this, once again, there's this one-to-one, -one it's almost like you folded the paper in half and, and created an ink block. You know, the, uh, ink. Here's the soliton, dispersive wave, soliton, dispersive wave, and these are held 
And as it begins to propagate down the fiber, the whole thing begins to, to evolve. You can see this parasoliconic type structures. This is, these are the dispersive waves held with it. And you get to end up with just a burst of solitons flying across this system. Of course, it's very, very noisy, uh, uh, but this integrates in time. If you get enough very noisy things, it always looks great. It's just totally flat. And you think, wow, that is super. <coughs> but it's you know, really, really just bursts of noise. And of course, this can be extended up to pumping with exceedingly high powers. This is, a, uh, in fact, pumping with almost an, well, it is an industrial scale laser, a 300 watt euterbium fiber laser. And in this case, you can then pull the dispersive waves into the visible, generate the red. This is the, the dispersion zero here. We always get this dip as the solitons pull that way and the dispersive waves go that way. And you can get up to about 50 watts uh, from this system and, and quite a lot of power in the visible. But really it's just, it's, it's, just a, it's really just a, a laser torch. It's just shining out noise out the end of this fiber. And to be quite honest, in the CW regime, it's interesting scientifically, but as a commercial or really is an applied tool, it's worthless. So this is really just showing, and the, and, and the final bit in this shows the evolution of uh, super continuum, uh, just a little movie that shows you the way the whole thing is. And um, it's a reasonably complicated process. And this shows you, um, Hopefully it's going to play. No, it looks like this isn't going to play for you, so I... I'll move it. Yeah. Oh. So you've your noise burst here. You begin to get the broadening of your spectrum. You see the solitons evolving in this, and you've a sea of solitons. They're all different durations. Uh, this is basically your noise-driven system. As this begins to propagate down the fiber, of course, you see all these different solitons. They're all different durations, so they're all different intensities. So you have a complete range of shifts because of the, sol the soliton self-frequency shift as well. And these continue further. This is the solid, sort of long wavelength edge, the, the nominal rogue wave. That's you know you're just your soliton self free. They collide with each other and generate a four-way mixing out here. This one hits the zero dispersion. This is the dispersive wave. With the dispersive wave, you can get mixing with this soliton over here and this and generate a four-wave mixing here. So it ends up getting kind of complicated. Meanwhile, the, the super continuum is really evolving. More seas of solitons, they all approach the zero dispersion and stop there. They can't go any further. They leach into it, and you get dispersive waves bleeding off them. Once again, soliton, soliton interactions here in time. You get four wave mixing into the, into this, the far infrared, or the infrared. So it shows you that the, the process is kind of complicated. Uh, if you want to go further uh, into the infrared, one of the simple techniques then is to is simply to you you can use other materials. Silica is not too good. Um, above about two microns, silicon really has a, a pretty high loss of about 100 uh, dB per kilometer. Germanium oxide or germanium, on the other hand, has a similar loss, um, but in fact, if you think about it, it's more attractive. So beyond about two microns, germanium, although it has a lower loss, which is still big, if you think about it, the process that it's pushing out to the long wavelength side is the Raman gain. Uh, but the Raman gain of germanium oxide, if you think back to the first lecture, is about 10 times higher, which means then that you can use much, much shorter lengths of fiber. You can use an order of magnitude less in the length of fiber. So if you develop a 
this is a, a little tiny small thulium femtosecond uh, oscillator stretched and then amplified just a single amplifier up the modest quite par you know modest powers um, and this is then great and compressed and launched into this this system here you only need about three meters of fiber this is the pump frequency you can see you get Super continuum generation now up to about three, three and a half microns with this system. And this is really at a very modest power. It's 100 milliwatts, uh, uh, 800 femtosecond pulses. So there's only 12 kilowatts of peak power here. And this can be scaled very, very readily. Uh, you know, another amplifier put in and this can be shortened. Uh, so once that would be done, you could actually cut this fiber again, maybe down to the, well, definitely down to the, uh, centimeter type length and if that happens really if you power scale by about an order of magnitude you should be able to generate up to about four and a half microns using germanium oxide but once again as you notice uh, because of where the zero dispersion sits in comparison to the pump wavelength it's only a soliton Raman uh, super continuum so the if just to summarize all that about super continuum uh, if you have femtosecond pulses, self-phase mo um, mo major uh, modulation dominates in the normal dispersion regime. And, and that may be probably one of the best regions to work in. In the anomalous regime, soliton dynamics, they, they actually dominate. And high-order solitons give you this compression or soliton fission, as they now call it. And after an initial phase of very, very rapid compression, where essentially oh, it occurs over the, essentially the dispersive length divided by the soliton number, you get this very short pulse. And then after that, everything just falls apart. And the systems then become actually, they aren't coherent. It's not a coherent supercontinuum. Long pulses in the normal regime, Raman dominates and self-phase modulation. As you go into the uh, anomalous regime, uh, as you increase the pulse duration, this soliton fission technique with the soliton falls apart. It, it's not really important anymore. It's modulation instability and soliton Raman gain that give you the, the, the gain process. Uh, and so you get MI, four wave mixing, then you get solitons, dispersive waves, but they're really, really noise based sources. This just shows you the um, difference between pumping in, in the, as you, as you actually change from pumping in the short wavelength side to the long wavelength side, what happens with your solitons or your spectrum. And so you can, you're pumping here about 600 nanometers, the zero dispersions down this line here. As you increase 6, 650, 700, now you're straddling around the zero. Your, you know, your, your broadening brings you in, your self-phase modulation brings you into the anomalous regime. You get solitonic structures here. As you actually straddle the, the, the pump line, you get a much more efficient super continuum. These are the cell, soliton cell frequency shifted signatures, and they're actually identified by these strong soliton-like structures that occur in the spectrum. Similarly, it depends on your pulse wavelength, and this is really just a repeat showing that you can have operation in in the normal regime where Raman dominates, around the zero where you have four wave mixing and modulation instability, and in the anomalous. So this is really the summary of everything. In the normal, Raman would dominate self-phase modulation. Around the zero, four wave mixing, MI and solitons. Fully in the anomalous, you get MI and Raman solitons. So that sort of summarizes everything on super continuum. So, um, I will sort of get rid of that, and while I'm changing over, does anyone want to ask uh, any question about anything? And I'll... No? Okay. Yeah. So... Scott. Um, do you have uh, approaches for the one micron pumping? Maybe it was early in your collection of slides. Um, with femtosecond pulses where you do dispersion control, you know, to, to get a short pulse, like at the thulium case at the end, you showed kind of an external grading compressor. Uh -huh. 
Have you been able to integrate the dispersion control at one micron? I noticed in the picosecond case, maybe you didn't need it. Yeah, yeah. But in the femtosecond case at one micron, is there a, you have clever ideas for integrating the dispersion control? Yes. Uh, you, I might cover it in this. Okay. All right. I'll, where I'll stand we, by. Where we actually use, we, we actually use just uh, photonic band gap fiber, oh, okay. air core fiber, and you have anomalous dispersion in the long wavelength ends of that. And so it allows you to compress the pulses and that can, but I'll, sh I'll show you some, some okay. experiments just integrating that as a, as a complete Great, thank unit. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, well uh, is that okay, Tiago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, basically an hour. And what I'd like to do is uh, change track a bit and sort of talk about different sources one of, one of the things um, really is that silica-based sources or fi silica-based fiber provides you with an enormous arsenal of things that you can do, uh, not just super continuum. And I, I really just want to cover a few bits and pieces of that. <clears throat> so if you look at silica-based devices and silica-based sources, you have the, the, the sort of three main winners are ytterbium, erbium, ytterbium, erbium, and thulium. Uh, but this actually leaves enormous spaces in, in, the, in the spectrum. And this is the window of transparency of silica, roughly from about 300 to, say, two and a half. I've put bismuth, and, and really, from this, you can see that ytterbium sort of single mode, you can get 10 kilowatts. You can approach 100 kilowatt multi-mode from, can you imagine a fiber laser, you know, 10 kilowatts? Uh, roughly, Herbium just below a kilowatt for single mode structure, and similarly for thulium. And thulium is actually on the rise. There's a lot of interest in thulium at the moment. I put in bismuth. Uh, bismuth, of course, is not a rare earth, uh, but and bismuth in it itself has not really been commercially developed. It hasn't been particularly successful. Most of the devices actually need to be cooled. Uh, they, you get some room te temperature operation. And I've shown it operating here between roughly 1.1 and 1.4. Uh, but that's not from a single dopant, and that's not from a single host. You have to change the host. So that becomes a problem. So really, a low bismuth covers this. It's not really commercially developed. And typically, output powers are going to be 10 watts, which, which is quite impressive, you know, really, for a fiber laser. Raman itself. Uh, simply shifting from a ytterbium system and cascading using different Raman orders allows you to cover any wavelength you want in the near infrared here. And I've shown that roughly operating around the level of about 50 watts. That's typical of what you can do. And very easily in the lab, you'll do 50 watt Raman lasers. The, but you're going to need roughly 100 watt pumps or 60 watt pumps, something like that. I've shown super continuum sort of operating around the tens of watts level, but this is actually totally unfair because if you select any given wavelength, you aren't going to have 10 watts. Whereas with ytterbium, you're going to have a kilowatt around a micron, but at super continuum, you aren't going to have 10 watts. And what's happening is that people are buying super continuum sources, and, and rightfully so, they're actually able to select with the bandwidth and select sort of different wavelengths. But of course, it's milliwatts they're going to get. Not, not. What you can do, of course, to get into the visible is just take the direct second harmonic of the Raman. And although this won't be fully fiber based, it can be fiber integrated. And so this can operate at the level of about 10 watts. You can do parametric mixing in fiber. And this is sort of going to operate around the level of a few watts uh, for any given wavelength. And I'll show some results on that. Or you can go the other route and move into the uh, infrared, mid-infrared, and using difference frequency generation, which isn't going to happen in the, in, in the uh, fiber, but you can use that in uh, crystals outside. You can propagate all the way up to, theoretically, you can get up to whatever essentially you want. It's getting the material to act as the host. But in reasonably available materials like PPLN, periodically pulled in the niobate, you can generate up to about five and a half microns. 
And that's all based on this Mopfa technology. And all you do is you put your nonlinear conversion at the back end of it. It's all fiber integrated. And so you can develop any of these that you want. Second harmonic, some frequency, third, fourth, in tandem, all in periodically polled crystals. And you, in fiber, you can do Raman, self-phase modulation, fovea mixing, solitonic effects, or supercontinuum. So what he uses the seeds. So over the last few years, there's been considerable development of uh, fiber lasers. And this is just a, a schematic of a, a sort of typical fiber laser system. You have the gain block, depending on what material you want. Uh, sort of isolator polarization control, if this isn't a polarization dependent. Some tunable device and the satchable absorber placed on the, on, on the, couple, on the fiber coupler. And the gain media, once again, is anything you want. You terbium, erbium, thulium, or ramen. And you have an enormous choice of satchable absorbers that you can use for these. Of course, if you're using a CSAM, it's on a mirror, so you want to actually have a, um, a circulator in here, have this bit on the end of that, or, or have this as a linear cavity. So what's the advantage of them? Well, the CSAMs were the things that were really originally developed. Uh, the saturation intensity needed for them is about 50 megawatts per square centimeter. And they have a recovery time, which can be changed. Of course, you can um, you know, sort of use radiation to, to change the uh, recovery time of this. Um, and you can change from 10 to less than a picosecond. A typical sort of uh, absorption profile of that, developed for a, a 106 micron laser, has a width of about 20, 30 nanometers. The disadvantage, of course, is that these are relatively expensive to manufacture. And for each laser at a different wavelength, you need a different device. Uh, and although I say it's expensive to manufacture, from each chip, you can actually get quite a few satchable absorbers. <clears throat> the one that we have actually looked at quite extensively is, is nor uh, the carbon nanotube. And as, as many of you know, the sort of absorption wavelength uh, that you get from a carbon nanotube is roughly about one and a half times D, where D is the, the diameter of the tube. So if you're looking for an absorber around uh, one micron or one and a half microns, you want this diameter of the tube to be roughly a, a, a about uh, one nanometer or so. Um, the advantage of, of, of these is that the saturation intensity is relatively low. It's about uh, 10 megawatts per square centimeter, and that can be easily achieved with a fiber laser. And this is into this E11 sort of uh, transition. Uh, so you simply excite, generate uh, electrons here, leave a hole behind, and this will recombine of the order of a half a picosecond or so. You can actually use the transition for the E22, uh, and this uh, gives you greater flexibility. Uh, uh, the recovery time um, that will thermalize in about 50 femtoseconds. And so the saturation intensity sort of indicates that if you think roughly it's going to be the same absorption coefficient, the recovery time is going to uh, change your saturation intensity then by the, roughly the ratio of these lifetimes. So you have about a 10 times increase in the saturation intensity. Uh, for the, using the 22 transition, which is about 200 megawatts. But once again, uh, it can be, can be used quite easily. And this actually shows a, a single um, uh, carbon nanotube. This is the E11, E22 transition. And you can see that that's been successfully used to, modular, to actually mode lock all these short pulse lasers from thulium, Raman systems, erbium system, bismuth, Raman, again, ytterbium. So it, one single absorber covers everything here. It's in a polymer host, which can be damaged in the system, which is a, a problem. These, of course, are resonant. You're meant, you, know, you can use these resonances. But actually, what you can do is actually just throw in a mixture of tubes. And the resonances will be shifted all over the place. It will actually increase this sort of background loss. But usually with a, a fiber laser, the gain is so high, it doesn't really matter about the loss. It can handle it quite easily. So simply just make a, you can make a, a mixture of carbon nanotubes, fire them into a polymer host, polish it up, stick it between your laser, and it'll probably work for any laser. 
Then, of course, there's the ubiquitous graphene that everyone has been looking at. The, the big advantage of graphene, of course, is uh, that a single layer will give you about 2.3% absorption. And this can be saturated uh, of the order of, you know, the, the reports are between 10 and 200 megawatts per square centimeter, and recovery times 100 femtoseconds. Uh, the advantage, of course, is it's totally flat. You have this uh, flat absorption, and this is the absorption profile of graphene in PVA. You have a few little ripples here in the uh, around two microns due to the, the, the PVA. Once again, it's a, a polymer host, and uh, the big advantage is that usually the, the, the non-saturable loss of graphene is lower than uh, with the, the other nanotubes. And in a way, it's a universal saturable absorber. It'll operate at any wavelength you want. You can see, basically, it's absorbed over all that. In the last few years, there's been, um, particularly the last there's been enormous interest in these other 2D materials, for example, um, molybdenum sulfide, selenide, tungsten sulfide, whatever. And the saturation intensities of these are uh, typically the same, somewhere between 1 and 150 megawatts per square centimeter, with relatively fast recovery times. They are, are resonant devices, but actually what, what is found is that these will actually operate quite well up uh, around 1.5 for erbium lasers. And the, the, the reason is that it's really, um, it's really just defects in the, in, the, in the material that are acting as a saturable absorber. Uh, and this actually shows it uh, mode locking erbium uh, over the range of the complete gain bandwidth of erbium, generating sub picosecond pulses. The problem, of course, uh, with the molybdenum sulfide is that, in fact, it won't really mode lock uh, one micron effectively because as you begin, begin to get short pulses in it, you get multi-photon effects that absorb into the actual resonant uh, bands of the molybdenum sulfide, and it acts then as a reverse saturable absorber. So as you begin to get short pulses, they begin to get absorbed through two photon effects, and you end up Q-switching the laser. Quite often when you Q-switch the lasers, um, you damage the host uh, because it damages the polymer. But the big, the big disadvantage of all these mode lock lasers, particularly for seeding MOPFA systems, is that you have a fixed repetition rate. You've no real flexibility in the pulse duration. You just mode lock it and that's it. And you get roughly you know, a few picoseconds or femtoseconds. You can put in a bandwidth control, but you can't really control the, the pulse width continuously. And the reason is that most of them actually operate as solitons. Quite often, a lot of them are soliton or soliton light lasers as well. And we saw this earlier, where with solitons also you have very limited um, uh, average powers. Once you have a soliton, you're limited by the soliton energy. One of the things that we've looked at uh, is actually to develop this so-called universal pulse source. Uh, and that actually has no, um, no rare earth gain. And this is just simply a piece of the main oxide fiber. In this case, it's about 100 meters long. Um, and this provides Raman gain. And this is pumped by a CW laser, and the CW laser is just a Raman fiber laser. And you can generate a CW Raman fiber laser at any wavelength you want. Uh, simply use a, a ytterbium and cascade it. So you can pick whatever wavelength you want CW to pump this, and you'll get CW laser action. If you put graphene in the system, and all you have is an isolator, and uh, the pump going in, and the graphene, you'll get a pulse coming out. Now, this is actually in the normal dispersion regime, so you're not limited by solitons. And in the normal regime, the characteristic, of course, is that you get these long pulses because you're going to get lots of dispersion. The characteristic is this square-like spectra that you get from normal dispersion. So it's a long pulse of about 500 picoseconds. You can take that out. This is actually lasing at about 1.6. As you take it out, you just put it into a standard fiber, and this will actually give you anomalous dispersion. Here, this is normally dispersive. So the front end of the pulse is red. The back end is blue. You put it into a standard fiber where you'll have anomalous dispersion, and this compresses down to two picoseconds. And you can do this at any wavelength you want. So you can generate a short pulse laser 
simply from just a piece of fiber and a piece of grafting, nothing else. It can power scale up to whatever you want because you aren't limited by soliton powers. So normal dispersion actually allows you quite a bit of flexibility in generating long pulses that can be amplified so that you have no problems about nonlinearity in your amplifier. And this is one system that's developed here and, and just generate a long pulse through in, in, simply inserting roughly a kilometer of fiber. It's mode locked using a carbon nanotube uh, and the advantage of that is that you get real saturable absorption which actually cleans the pulse better than using polarization rotation. If you try and do polarization rotation with such a laser, you actually end up with a long pulse, but there's lots of noise structure underneath it. It's actually not a clean pulse. With the saturable absorber, it is. It's a single clean pulse. You can see that the structure, once again, has this square profile in the spectrum, uh, which is indication of dispersion. Uh, so it's a long pulse. It's relatively narrow in, in spectrum, about 0.8 nanometers. Uh, the pulse duration itself is about a nanosecond, and you get one pulse per round trip, which is going to be in the sort of order of about 250 kilohertz. Now, you could try and think about compressing that using grating pairs, but the grating pairs would actually need to be roughly about 100 meters apart. So you're not going to be able to do that experimentally. Well, you could, but it would be quite difficult. The simple way to do that is actually to use uh, a chirp brag grating. And this is a grating, roughly this grating is roughly a meter long, and it's directly written. And next week, Raman Kashup will be here with you, and you'll hear, actually, he's the person who made this for us. You'll probably hear about writing these long chirp gratings. Uh, and so I won't spend a lot of time. I'll, all I'll show you is actually what the result of that is. And this shows you the spectrum at input. This is the spectrum at output, or the duration at output. It's compressed down to about 11 picoseconds from a nanosecond. So really almost two orders of magnitude compression. There's little bits still left in the wings of the pulse. And this is really due to essentially not complete dispersion correction. But it is, it's quite near uh, to what we theoretically predicted. It's about twice beyond what we got. We, we theoretically predicted five picoseconds. We got 11. If you actually change the system so that you have a noise burst, you can see that you have real correction clearly in this case. A noise burst won't correct off a grating, of course. And so the input and output are, this is the noisy spectrum. The output, after going through the grating, looks exactly the same. As, so you do get no correction at all. What is this used for? Well, actually, one of the things that we were asked to develop one of these systems for was to get a low repetition rate supercontinuum source for people to use in biology. Um, they were looking at devices for transient absorption techniques, which I think you'll probably hear about maybe this afternoon. Uh, and so you excite something, essentially synchronous with that, you essentially put up like a, a background light behind it, and you probe and see what happens. For, uh, as time goes on. And lots of biological materials, the time scale of the, these things happen quite long, so you don't want the pulses to be occurring at megahertz repetition rate. You want them to occur quite slowly so that you can see the evolution. And this was, we developed a, a very simple supercontinuum source. Uh, for 100 milliwatts of pump power, you have a source that simply covers the, the, the normal type spectrum. So the other thing, uh, of course, is that with these pump pulses, you want to increase their energy. And everyone knows this, um, this technique of chirp pulse amplification, uh, where you minimize nonlinearity in the amplifier. Uh, this was developed by uh, Strickland and Maru about 30 years ago. If you take a pulse, uh, if you were to put this pulse directly into the amplifier, as it get amplified, you'd simply see nonlinear problems. You're amplifying short pulses, so you have massive intensity. You get super, a super continuum in the amplifier. So what you do is you stretch the pulse so that the pulse has a chirp through it. You put it into the amplifier then because it's very long. You can increase the energy of it, no problem. And you won't get nonlinearity because you've lots of energy but a long duration. 
and outside then you compress externally and then you get your high power. Well this can be done in fiber and so you can take a ytterbium source for example at one micron, stretch it, put it, uh, put it in an amplifier and then compress in an all fiber chirp pulse amplifier. And this we've demonstrated with all the major fiber laser systems, ytterbium, ytterbium, erbium and raman. Uh, our initial demonstrations were done at about uh, tens of watts average power, peak power is approaching 100 kilowatts. Raman of course is a bit lower because uh, in actual fact the, the, the sort of you're, you're limited also in the lengths of fiber and stuff you're using. Oh, don't know what that was. Microsoft encountered a problem. Sorry about that. Didn't know what went on. I do apologize. Um, doesn't like it for some reason. Yeah. Um, I'll just leave that out, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll probably have to go on from that. I have no idea what happened with that. Um, unfortunately, yeah, I'll tell you what happens then. <laughs> you, you can compress the pulses. Uh, the reason that, that it works is you actually use the uh, photonic band gap. If you use an air core fiber, if you can think of it, you have a, basically a, a structure with a, a loss profile in it. And so with any loss profile, you have a dispersion associated with that. The short wavelength side, you have normal dispersion. The long wavelength side, you have anomalous dispersion. So within the, the air core fiber, if you operate to the sort of longer wavelength side of that, you get enormous dispersion. And the dispersion you can get is of the order of, I don't know why it's... Uh, Yeah. Yeah, you can you can see in that. Well, ah, actually, actually, I'll, I'll just I'll use that. I don't know I don't know what what the problem is. So, um, as you can see, this is basically the air core photonic band gap fiber. This is the anomalous dispersion that you get, and you can sit in this. Uh, for example, this uh, examples are for erbium but you can do exactly the same with your, your terbium, which we've done that with. Uh, and this is the actually a uh, um, terbium result here. <clears throat> you can actually see that the pulses were chirped up to about 100 picoseconds, 81 picoseconds, and they compress on the edge of this. You can see the input and output spectra remain the same, so clearly there's no nonlinear, additional nonlinearity happening. The big advantage, of course, with air is that you can use up to a thousand times. It's about a thousand times less nonlinear than, than glass. So you can use power levels up to about a thousand times what you can get in glass before you'll start to see additional nonlinearity. And this compresses on the edge uh, to about sub peak a second. And this can be done as long as you have a fiber with a, an air core at any wavelength for any sort of system that you want to use. Pardon? Is splice to the That's spliced, yes. It's all it's all fully integrated. It's a totally integrated system. Yeah. How much power can you uh, we're, we're in that system there, I think we were operating at the watts level, several watts. Tens tens of watts. So it was basically uh, this was essentially a conventional sort of ten watt amplifier. So we're 10 watts average power. But there's no reason why you couldn't scale that up more. 
<laughs> well, yeah, definitely tens okay. Um, so, um, what I want to show you is that there can be slight problems with it. Um, I don't know why that one's not shown at all, but uh, you can see the sort of <laughs> those with very good eyesight are those in the expensive seats at the front. <laughs> can see and, and really what it shows you it just shows you that the input and output are slightly different this is the stretch pulse up to about 100 picoseconds but the thing that is tricky about the whole process is that it's very very wavelength dependent and because on this edge here you have an enormous change in the dispersion and the high order dispersion is quite significant and so if you even change by like 5 or 10 nanometers, the higher order dispersion changes and you can't get exactly the same comp compression uh, as you would. So you end up getting slight differences in the compression available for different wavelengths. Uh, you, you can compress back down to um, picosecond type durations, but you'll get maybe variations between 1.5 and, and 2 picoseconds, something like that. Of course, you can do it in bulk, and this is a very, very simple bulk one. Uh, it's, it's basically all fiber polarization maintaining, uh, and it's operating uh, at about, this is about four and a half watts, and you just use a pair of transmission gratings. And this is actually, this actually has a, a footprint smaller than this laptop. And with that, you have uh, pulses of about 150, 140 femtoseconds, 270 kilowatts peak about two and a half watts average power. I'll actually see if this will now operate. It does. Oh, woo. <laughs> uh, and, and really it just shows that you can make very, very compact systems. Um, on the side, and I won't spend any time on this, this is simply just a scaling system this is a system that we're actually developing at the minute uh, to use to pump in the, uh, actually as a pump source for the mid-infrared generation in uh, difference frequency mixing. And this is just a, once again one of these cascaded amplifiers uh, with chirp pulse amplification. Uh, and it's pumped with uh, 120 watts um, <coughs> diodes. Uh, in fact, there's two of these pumped in this system. Uh, and it's a large mode area. Basically, it's a simple picosecond amplifier uh, or femtosecond mode lock system through a cascade of amplifiers uh, compressed. And this is giving about 40 watts average pop with compressed pulses of about 400 femtoseconds. And this is to be used in a, in, in a, in a future mixing thing, which you'll show, I'll show you at the back end. Of course, you've no need to do it with amplifiers. You can actually do uh, build a very, very simple um, mode lock system based on polarization rotation and, and also these uh, large mode area polarization preserving euterbium systems. There's a euterbium amplifier that we built, uh, pumped uh, with 120 watts of multi-mode. Pulse duration is about 120 femtoseconds. Uh, pulse energy is about half a microjoule, 50 megahertz, 30 watts average power. In the Peak power is about uh, four and a half megawatts. And this is just a very simple fiber loop system with quite a reasonable beam quality outside. And the, the sort of mode diameter of the fiber here is about 40 microns to minimize nonlinearity. So the source of choice of lots of people for sources for, for excitation sources, for example, in biology, um, uh, this is the supercontinuum source. Lots of these have been bought, and, and we've seen all the dynamics. And they've been bought for people who actually want to select pulses to excite something. And what I want to say, and I want to point out to you, is that you have to be very, very careful with one of these. Um, as you saw earlier, this is what you get from one of these. Uh, so at the end of the fiber, if you're pumping a commercial system, and this is basically what a commercial system is. It's just a seated MOPFA system, piece of fiber. 
And typically, you'll get this super continuum that will look like this. This is usually a single spectrum. When they sell you this, uh, they do the integrated spectrum in the brochure that smooths it all off, so it looks lovely. But in the time domain, if you try and see what you're getting, uh, this is the wavelength, this is the pulse dura delay. So if you select from this continuum, say you select that spectral region, this is what you're getting. You aren't getting a single pulse. You're getting essentially a burst of noise. And it has an envelope that roughly lasts approximately the duration of the pump pulse. But within that, you have lots of noisy sp spikes. Similarly, if you go to the dispersive regime, you have simply a total noise spectrum. This is just a complete bunch of noise. But here it's even worse because you have these really intense solitons, and they're totally uncontrollable. Uh, the next pulse you'll select might have only one soliton in it. The next one after that will have three of them. And they'll just be within that peak a second envelope, and they're just varying all the time and varying intensity. So if you're trying to look at nonlinear optics or trying to use that as a pump for something, the pump power that you think you have in the pulse, you definitely don't have. So you have to be very careful about that. Similarly, in the femtosecond system, the only place you can really select is here. If you select up here, you're getting exactly the same mess that you get in the picosecond pump systems. So you have to select after the pulse, which is in the femtosecond supercontinuum, use the shortest piece of fiber possible so that it compresses down to this single soliton with the extremely broad bandwidth and the very short duration. Because after that, all the instabilities of self-interaction, high-order dispersion, soliton-soliton collision, soliton-soliton interaction, self-ramming, just wreck everything. And it's just a complete shambles of, of noise. So if you select from that, you'll, you'll, you get what you deserve. You won't get a, a really good pulse. Okay? Alternatively, and, and actually what is a good idea, particularly if you have a lot of high peak power with your femtosecond pulse, is simply just use normal dispersion and self-phase modulation. And then you can select that nicely. And if you remember the problem you had yesterday, from a nice dispersed self-phase modulated spectrum, you can select a nice, quite short pulse. And Hugo, Hugo proposed such things years ago to correct, you know, for example, using anomalous dispersion and spectral uh, narrowing and stuff like that. So all this stuff is, is, the ideas behind it are very easy if you think about it. So it's just don't select willy-nilly from a super continuum, you know, as you might not get what you think you're going to get. So what we want to do uh, is also develop sources where people can actually select what pulse they want, what repetition rate they want, and what sort of wavelength they want. So the ideal would be if you had a box and you said, I'd like to get a one peak a second pulse at 20 gigahertz, and uh, I want that at sort of one point five five or one point six eight or one point oh three. That would be ideal, wouldn't it? And spectrophysics would sell you that at an enormous cost. So as an approach to that, one of the simple techniques is to actually use this method that was developed by Mamashev actually twenty years ago, which is uh, essentially it's a generating a wavelength repetition rate and pulse width versatile seed source that can be put into amplifiers and stuff. And it's simply just based on phase modulation. So if you have a phase modulator, then, and you just sort of apply it to a CW signal, you'll just get a phase modulation that will run across the pulse. And if you look at that in the intensity regime, it's just CW. You have a single, there's nothing changing in intensity. If you then apply a spectral mask to that, and you throw away everything that's here. So everything, so this is, this is phase, so with time, d phi by dt just gives you a shift in wavelength. So the wavelength is essentially the antiphase of this. So this is the wavelength, sweeping in wavelength. If you put a bandwidth in and throw away that, you can afford to throw away that, you're left with these little bits at the top, and you get pulses. 
but the pulses are going to be relatively long. So if you're doing this at gigahertz repetition rates, these are going to be tens of picoseconds. And they're going to have relatively low power because you had a sort of low power seed signal. You've gone through a modulator and you've thrown away 90% of your signal anyway. But what you can do is you can think about soliton physics and use the solitons then to compress this. If you remember, the adiabatic gain will compress any sort of pulse. So in here you have the a small tunable diode laser, your phase modulator, amplified, and you go through another amplifier here uh, after you've gone through your bandpass filter. And this is filtered out half of the spectrum. This is the phase modulated spectrum. This is half of it filtered away. And now you feed that bit into Raman gain. So you pump from this end with a Raman laser. And this is a long, long fiber. And you're looking for this adiabatic gain. And so you get adiabatic gain, which exponentially grows. You can see that as you increase the pump power, then the pulse duration as it comes from the uh, output of the fiber layer, or the amplifying fiber, the Raman fiber, uh, goes from about 10 picoseconds down into the order of a, a few hundred seconds. And it's simply the duration you get is power dependent. So as you tune the power, of the pump for the gain, you can tune the duration of the pulse. And if you put in various wavelengths, you can tune throughout the gain bandwidth of the amplifier and compress them. And they're all fairly similar from ranges from 260 to 300 femtoseconds. So this gives you a variable pulse width, variable wavelength, variable repetition rate source. But it has to be in the soliton regime. Uh, you can't do it at any other way. So it needs anomalous dispersion. And once again, the energy is limited by solitons. Uh, so it's soliton limited, although the average power is in the watt level. The pulse duration sort of, as I say, is limited by solitons. And probably greater flexibility in terms of duration is just given by a CW source and a straightforward amplitude modulator. But this gives you uh, some technique to do it. It would be great if you could do it at one micron to do it with, uh, uh, for example, the ytterbium. And you could think, well, photonic crystal fibers about. But could you imagine using a length of 20 kilometers of photonic crystal fiber? Of course, the manufacturer would love it if you bought that. But, uh, <laughs> but it actually wouldn't work anyway. The loss would be too high. But once you get into very short pulses, you can do it with short pulses because you can actually use photonic crystal fiber with a taper in it. And that, if you remember back to the first lecture, also can act like a quasi-amplifier because if it tapers, the power density increases, the soliton thinks it's been amplified, so it changes its length. And that has been done. Uh, this actually shows it um, happening uh, in, in, a, in a tapered fiber. And this was a tapered uh, PCF launching um, roughly a, a picosecond. And you can get very short pulses take pulses out of about 50 femtoseconds. And the big problem, of course, is that once you start getting this in lots of this PCF, you get this Raman self-frequency shift as well. And this actually shows it happening towards the sort of output end of this as you increase the energy launched. You can see it shifting in time and generating pulses that are tunable from essentially 106 to 1.25 femtosecond type duration, tunable in wavelength. And this is really only over a very short PCF taper of about 40 meters. OK, so there are probably other techniques that you can do. And if you remember way back, um, um, there was Paolo talked about four-wave mixing uh, or parametric generation. And um, <clears throat> this is one of the, the, the methods that we've used to try and introduce visible sources based on fiber. Uh, I'm, We've had relative, well, it does work, but to be quite honest, it will never be commercialized. Uh, this is essentially the four wave mixing curve that you get if you pump in the normal dispersion regime, if you remember that. Um, outside that, in the anomalous regime, of course, you get nominal four wave mixing, and that's just modulational instability. And so you never get extensive. These are just the sidebands that vary uh, in the system. And these, of course, would vary with power. And of course, so does the phase matching here, you, uh, uh, the, the effective phase matching power.
But you can see that if you have a, a system with a zero dispersion of about 1.1, you pump around 106, you can generate a pulse uh, with a sig uh, an idler about 1.8 and a signal around 800. And as you vary the wavelength of the tunability of your pump source, you should be able to simply tune this and tune this. It will just self-select where it phase matches given by this curve. So a very simple approach to that is just use a, a gain switch laser diode, uh, amplified up to about 20 watts, and launched into a, a cavity containing a, a piece of this PCF, uh, and hope that you get this phase, well, you will get this phase matching occurring. This was done for relatively long pulses, uh, pumping around a couple of hundred picoseconds, really from a, a, a gain switch diode. And you can see that the uh, output from this system uh, is actually shorter, as you'd expect, through the nonlinear process. As you vary the cavity length, you can, of course, you can see that uh, you only get matching, so it is synchronously pumped. Roughly, this is about the duration of the pump pulse. <coughs> and output powers for pump powers of about 15 watts, you can take out about 300, 350 milliwatts. And this is tunable over different, different sort of bands depending on the pulse duration, or the wavelength of the pump. You can see as you uh, vary the, 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 the pump wavelength, then you can get, this is the sort of pump, this is the parametric at 750. And as you vary the wavelength of this and launch that, you can get tunability of the parametric around 700. But it's problematic that you have a cavity, you have to have matching, you know, it, it, it uses extra optics. It's not really a simple approach to it. And, uh, that, and you've no really variation of the repetition rate. If you vary the pump rate, you have to change the cavity dynamic and it's, it's not, not good. So you can do it single pass. And although it may cause an increase in the pump power, that's all achievable through the, the pump that's available through uh, your turbine-based systems. And the approach here was that simply to use just a single CW laser diode and then use a Mach Zender that's driven by an uh, electronic uh, signal generator, amplified up to the typical level of about 20 watts, and then just launch single pass into the parametric uh, fiber. You can tune your source here. This is a actually a laser diode that's attached to a, a long period, uh, well, a grating on a piece of fiber. And this is just tuned through bending the, the grating. And this gives you the tunability of the system from about 105 to 1075. And the pulse durations are simply determined by whatever you want to drive from 300 picoseconds to two nanoseconds at whatever repetition rate you want, one to 30 megahertz in this system. Uh, and this gives you the tunability, once again, of the amplified system, a little bit of spectral broadening as compared to the seed. This was actually a, a slightly birefringent fiber, so in fact you get two phase matching conditions depending what axis you're exciting on. And this just shows the summation of the tunability of this system. About 100 nanometers of tunability uh, using about 20, 30 nanometers of pump tunability. Uh, spectral bands are broadened through self-phase modulation uh, uh, of the, in the PCF. And you can get any really durations from about 200 picoseconds to 1.5 nanoseconds. So this is beginning to get relatively interesting, but still, still not so good for visible generation. For real visible, you really need to shift the zero down uh, and further so that you can actually pump say around 780, which is the second harmonic of erbium, and you'll generate somewhere around 600. But the big problem, of course, is that as you do that, the core diameter of this fiber is getting smaller, the inefficiency in the pump. But it can be done, and this is just simply just showing that it was done in a, in a sort of seeded system using several amplifiers. It was frequency doubled, this is, and I'll explain that later in the next slide. Uh, and you can generate roughly uh, about half a watt average power, uh, about 600 nanometers. But it's, once again, relatively uh, complicated system. Uh, pulse durations are sort of in the 100 of picoseconds. So the problem really is, once again, the power scaling of this. 
and to go to even shorter wavelengths. To go to shorter wavelengths, you're going to need to, to have even smaller cord fibers. And the big problem also with the PCF is um, controlling the actual hole size during the pull. If you change that by even 1%, and you're talking about nanometer type holes, if you change that by 1%, it changes the phase matching over the, over the fiber quite considerably. So in the last sort of 15 minutes, I'll describe two extremes, one down in the visible and one in the mid-infrared. And uh, one of the systems that we've been developing um, for, and in fact, we've now installed it, uh, is being used for stead microscopy. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> there's a vast array of, of fluorophores that people use for imaging techniques in, in biology. And there's all these, everything seems to have an, a an acronym, PAM, STORM, STED, Resolve. You know, it's, it's actually mystifying if you're a physicist. You don't even know what it means. But basically, it means you've you got to image something that fluoresces, OK? Uh, and that's basically it. Um, and so in s stimulated emission depletion spectroscopy, uh, STED, Basically, you want most of these things are in the visible because they're sort of peering at them. Uh, you need something that has an excitation and a de-excitation wavelength that lies within the visible band. Green fluorescent protein is actually one of the real successes. It can be introduced and expressed in a huge number of biological samples. It's, it's actually non-phototoxic, so you can actually do in vivo imaging, which is really what they want to do. You don't want to kill things. And, doesn't give you the real information. And with it, it has a, an emission peak at about 510, which means it's suitable for depletion about 560. And uh, the thing about STED is as you increase the peak power, the resolution improves. So that you, you get sort of an idea from this. This is the green fluorescent protein. So you sort of want to excite it at about 450. And then it fluoresces. In the green here, this is this peak around 510. And you want to deplete it at 560. So you do want to deplete it by exciting into the excitation band. The idea is that you have your dyed sample. And then around that, you apply this annulus of de-excitation. And the resolution or the, that you can obtain is much, much better than the diffraction limit. And it's simply related to the uh, saturation intensity uh, divided by the intensity from the stead beam. So what you want to do is increase the intensity of the stead beam. And as you increase the intensity, essentially the annulus sort of leaches into this sort of blank region and you begin to remove fluorescence so that you're only left with a bit in the center. And as you increase the, the sort of intensity, this annulus closes up. And so you can see smaller and smaller images better than the diffraction limited. It's just nonlinear optics, essentially. Uh, and as you increase this factor here, this will increase. And the whole thing in the bottom increases. And so your resolution gets better than the, uh, essentially, what you can do with conventional optics. So nonlinear optics is helping conventional optics. So uh, what happens is that one of these biologists comes to you and he said, I want a wavelength of 560. I want a pulse energy that's about 35 picojoules. I want enough average power with that, whatever that means. It means really he has to play around with it and get it to the device and get it from the device and measure it. And he doesn't want you to kill the, the sample with too much power. I want a pulse of about 100 picoseconds to 2 nanoseconds, maybe selectable. Low repetition rates, because I don't want to hit this with too much continuous power. Diffraction limit at beam quality. I want, because I want this beam to be able to be manipulated into this annulus. I want it polarized, and I want it compact, and I want it efficient, and I want it tomorrow. Uh, OK? And you say, well, hey, why don't you use a semiconductor laser? And he says, yeah, that's compact. It's efficient. Uh, I'll give you half a watt. So really, you're below the energy you need. It has a dreadful beam quality. It has a fixed duration, roughly. You aren't going to be able to vary that too much. Of course, you can if you change the driver. But it's a bit limited in flexibility. Use the Thai Sapphire. Oh, yeah, that's good, he said. But it's costly. Big, large footprint, uh, You know, pumping an oppo. I don't really want to pay for someone to run this. I don't want to pay for the whole device. It'll give you roughly a watt. 
at 80 megahertz. It's a fixed repetition rate. Definitely has enough energy in the pulses. It's sort of pretty inefficient. Um, you know, 18 watts pump and 4% optical efficiency. And it's all fixed duration, femtosecond type pulses. So don't really want to have that. Well, use a super continuum. So you're trying to get out of this. You're saying, hey, you know, change this. I don't want to do this for you. And of course, this is reasonably good. It's compact. You can get up to sort of 9 milliwatts per nanometer at 560. Once again, you're, you're, you're hitting the energy OK. Relatively inefficient, 1% inefficient for 20 watt pump. And 10 picosecond pulses. And hey, look, you have this structure in the pulse. Remember I talked about that? It's all these solitons. It's all this awful structure. The intensity isn't the stead intensity that he needs. He, it's not controllable. So you say, okay, okay, I'll build one for you. And what we did was we built this system, which is really just a diode seated, modulated by a Max Zender modulator, amplified, and this then pumps a Raman fiber layer. And this just gives you Raman gain. This is one micron, six watts, gives you Raman gain. Now, generally, if you generate a Raman system and you sort of pump it and let it go, it, it builds up from noise. And so you actually have to use extended lengths so that you get enough gain. And the other problem is if you have an extended length, you get tremendous self-phase modulation building up. And so the, bra the bandwidth broadens. And remember, this is sort of generating the RAM. You're pumping at 106. The gain's at 1.12, and you're going to frequency double that to get 560 for the guy. Uh, and so if you have a very, very broad bandwidth, in the Raman signal, you aren't going to really convert that in a periodically pole crystal efficiently. So what you do is it's best to simply seed that, begin it with its own bits of noise. You feed the noise in that you want, and this builds up very, very quickly. You can use a very short length of Raman gain, two meters, in the polarization fiber, PM fiber. And then this can be very efficiently uh, frequency doubled. This actually shows what happens with the device. Uh, this is the sort of bandwidth of the seed, 0.04 nanometers. As you pump with the fundamental power, you have roughly uh, a second harmonic power here of about one and a half watts. It's frequency doubled to 560. And you can choose whatever pulse duration you want from 100 picoseconds up to two and a half nanoseconds over a range from two to 50 megahertz. The beam quality coming from this is from a single mode diode. It's essentially diffraction limited, and so you can manipulate this into your donut mode if you want. Uh, <clears throat> this has now been improved to actually incorporate. This is the periodically pulled crystal, which is actually fiber coupled. We've done this in, a, in association with Gooch and Co. This is now a commercial product. Um, this device is actually operating at about 2 watts average power um, at 560. I will be totally honest with you, when we operated this at uh, 15 watts average power, the, the fibers burned. Um, so it was a serious problem. But we can, we can operate these systems with up to 15, 20 watts uh, average power in the visible. Uh, but if you want a totally fiber pigtailed and efficient and reliable, uh, probably commercially you don't need probably up to about three watts before they would sort of put a limit on that. But the efficiency of the generation at 560 is about 50%. And of course, you can cascade once again. Raman, you can cascade. You can generate the uh, first stokes in any sort of bandwidth you want, and then seed it the second. And you can get whatever you want. And this is really tunable then using second harmonic. You can cover the range 488 to 900. And if you want you can use some frequency generation for 320 to 490. So what then happens in the last 10 minutes above 2 microns? And I should, should actually say this system is actually now running routinely uh, measuring stead imaging in, in, in uh, green fluorescent protein. So what happens if you want to actually go above 2 microns? Well, you can't use a fiber, OK? You can use, for example, chalcogenide fibers or fluoride fibers. But they're, number one, they're notoriously difficult to work with. Um, and so also, you don't get so many sources above that. So the, the longest wavelength you get in any fiber lasers in, in 
about 3.9, I think. Um, and they're very limited bands. So what happens if you want sort of tunability in the range from, say, 2 to 5 microns? So one of the things that we're interested in is, is actually to develop high power at these, not just milliwatts, but watts, tens of watts. Uh, so you can, you're limited by your rare earth dope fluoride fibers. Of course, you can get quantum cascade lasers, uh, but they're sort of limited. Quite often, they're cryogenic. Uh, the powers are approaching watt in, cer in certain wavelength ranges. No problem with that. It's one of these things where they say they cover all wavelengths, and of course they do, but they're very limited in the power ranges. Uh, you can, of course, use oppos once again, but you're sort of limited with cavity configurations. You're limited in the alignment, fixed repetition rates, for example. So difference frequency, actually, single pass, sort of represents a very, very simple solution, and, and both in the CW and in the pulse regime. But the problem is that you might have slightly lower efficiency and sort of higher thresholds. But at least with fiber laser pumping, you can always scale up the pump. It's pretty easy with anything based on a ytterbium fiber laser system to just put up the pump power. You know, uh, even at Imperial, we have a sort of ytterbium system operating, uh, a CW system operating at 400 watts. Uh, and it's in a small, compact package, sort of 19-inch rack type size. Uh, so euterbium is really, really efficient, and amplifier systems can be built that sort of cover the same sort of footprint, operating up to, as you saw, 40, 50 watts, femtosecond pulses. So this gives you a way to move forward. So the, one of the things that we started off in the first demonstration of this, as we, we sort of wanted, wanted to do a demonstrator before we went out begging for money, um, uh, and that was based on uh, the mixing or the, the difference frequency generation of two fiber-based mopfas. One is a euterbium, one's an erbium, and you simply use a common clock, combine these and put them into a difference frequency generation stage, and this is at one micron, and this is tunable. In fact, both are tunable, and this gives you, should give you tunability to start with uh, if you simply keep this fixed and tune this from about 3.2 to about 3.5. And the advantage of this, um, really using pulse seeding rather than CW seeding, is that um, the, peak, the, you know, the peak power requirement is, is quite easy to obtain. Uh, so you need much, much lower uh, using pulses rather than uh, CW. You have a very high pump conversion, which is possible since you have high peak powers. And the sort of easy thing to do is actually you can actually tune this very easily. Of course, you can change the, the common clock to whatever you want. You can change that from picoseconds to nanoseconds. But you can also s sort of slide the pump and, the, and the, one of the pumps through each other, and you'll only get pulse you know, generation where they overlap in time. But I do admit there's a little bit of uh, complexity to it, and you'll see what that looks like. <clears throat> it's a basic MOPFA system again, euterbium and erbium. You have a common modulator, and this was the early one. We only were using one modulator. Now we use two modulators in each system. You have a common clock that just supplies the driver to a CW seating diode here. And here in this system, the common clock is actually in the pulse shaper driving this modulator, and CW is going through here. They're relatively uh, narrow band. This is a 0.13 nanometers. The pulse durations that you get sort of from this uh, system here is roughly 150 picoseconds. The average power is 23 watts in this system, 2.5 kilowatts. Um, the erbium system, narrow band about 0.03, uh, and the pulse duration in this is... Uh, and this example is actually 400 picoseconds. And the airbeam system is tunable uh, simply by just simply tuning this laser diode. And the average power here is relatively lower. You don't really need I equivalent powers. This is actually just acting as, as, as the signal. And the peak power is about 100 watts. And you take both of these separately. 
Um, of course, you want to optimize the overlap, so you change it so that the mode size in the periodically pole, you just focus down into the crystal. The, you want the, basically the spot sizes to be both the same. And the spot sizes in this case were about 150 microns. And this is a very, this is a simple uh, pole, um, mag oxide, periodically pole lithium uh, niobate. It's actually made by Covision uh, in the UK. And the pump intensity is about 28 megawatts per square centimeter. And the, the, if you read up, people say the damage threshold in this is about you know, 100 megawatts per square centimeter to a gigawatt per square centimeter. So we're well below the, the damage threshold in this system. Uh, and we sort of look at that, this, take the signal and pump out, and simply then look at the idler and see what happens as we change the pump powers. And this shows you the sort of typical uh, tunability as we tune the airbeam system. This is the tunability of the uh, idler. Uh, relatively flat power in this uh, initial sort of trial, uh, three and a half to four watts. Uh, it sort of fits the calculation quite well. Bandwidth in the, in the generated uh, idler is about three nanometers. And sort of represents the sort of structure that was actually in the pump frequency as well. And uh, I should say, of course, that uh, the, the grating uh, within the periodically pole device had to be tuned as you tune the wavelength, of course. You, you don't get that for nothing. <coughs> If you look at the, um, what happens experimentally, um, this is simply the average pump power uh, at one micron, and you're looking at the generated power both in the idler and the signal, in the amplified uh, signal. Uh, so you can see they sort of rise and saturate a bit. Uh, this is the conversion efficiency. The conversion efficiency saturates, um, in fact, drops a bit. Uh, this is simply the generated powers and this is the power in the uh, combined system. This is the, com the actual idler up to about three and a half, four watts. The signal amplified up to about eight watts. And the, the actual system itself is driven, it's high, highly into saturation. So the signal is actually a lot higher than what we, we really need. We, we're operating you know, in this re regime here. <clears throat> and the re well, the advantage of that, of course, is it's very heavily saturated. So you can see the saturation in the amplified signal and the idler. But the advantage of that, of course, is you get a lot of power stability. If you have a slight fluctuation in your input signal, um, you don't get a, an enormous change in your, in your uh, idler or uh, output power. Uh, but the, of course, the, the disadvantage there is you have a slightly lower gain. So the question the, the, we really asked ourselves was, well, wh what was the reason for this roll-off? You know, we, we really had expected this to keep on going forever. Well, not forever, but keep on going. And we thought it was either um, sort of thermal effects. So simply we looked to see what happened to the beam. We've looked at the beam running at the relatively high powers, and there's no distortion in the beam at 25, 30, even, even up to 50 watts of pump power. There's no problem with that. The other thing, of course, that happens with these um, nonlinear crystals is that you get photorefractive effects. So you actually see green or other colors you know, generated in the crystal. And we had a look at that, and there was, that clearly wasn't happening pumped at these wavelengths. It, there's no problem. So the only other thing it could have been was back conversion. So we were actually sort of too efficient. We were generating essentially our signal and idler, and then we're back converting back into the pump. So we actually had a look at that, and the, the way we did that, we looked at the, uh, essentially the, the shape of the pump pulse, and we used a, a, a long pulse to have a look at this. And you can see we're pumping about 180 picoseconds, and this is sort of pumping about 200 milliwatts. As we increase the pump power, we can see an increase in the duration, and then as we increase here up to about 8 watts, we see sort of a dip in the system. Okay, so we have a dip in the profile uh, as if the, the sort of pump is being depleted. Uh, and then after that, about 12 watts, we then see the pump coming back again. <clears throat> and this is about the region here where we see this rollover. And so you can see, in fact, 
What in fact is happening is that it's now the, the signal and the idler are feeding back into the pump again. And so by about 16 watts of pump, this sort of bit that was initially depleted is now feeding back in again. So it's actually back, back conversion back into the pump. And of course that can be overcome um, by changing the pump in the crystal. And I should let you know that I don't have results on that, but this has been recently done. We've increased the powers, and these are now operating at the region of about 25 watts uh, in, the, in the signal and idler. Um, and we've scaled also to the CW regime, and actually we're using a 300 watt um, pump system at one micron to generate sort of very high average power CW in such a system. Okay, so what's the future of that? Well, of course, you have all these Raman systems that can act as, act as your, um, your signal as well. Uh, by keeping your euterbium sort of base pump, you can change these Raman wavelengths and sort of tune over, you know, sort of second, third, fourth, and generate whatever you want in these systems, helping with the Raman. So there's, there's quite a few different wavelengths you can generate. You can basically scan the window from two to 10. You won't do that with PPLN, that's, that's for sure. About, after about five and a half, your PPLN is going to run out of uh, transmission. So what I want you to get from this is that there's lots of sort of different things you can use. MOPFA systems in fiber really present you with enormous versatility. You can tune your wavelengths, you can tune your pulse durations, you can tune your pulse energies, you can tune your average powers from milliwatts to kilowatts. And you can cover the complete spectrum. So I've probably wasted my time doing research in supercontinuum for the last 10 years. There's alternative things that you can do. OK, thanks very much. A couple of questions. When we have coffee, you can ask a question if you want. <laughs> yeah? Oh, there, there's one. So the system that you made for STED imaging, uh, how much did it cost and how does it compare with the other solutions that you proposed? Uh, it's relatively simple. The, 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 if I had to cost it, the cost of building, um, I would put the cost of that if you were to build it in a lab about $15,000. So it's still relatively expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than, say, for example, an Oppo. Um, for us to build it for that, probably commercially, then it would, should cost about $30,000. And how much time did it take to come up with the system? Well, to, to develop that? Yeah. Uh, that took about uh, two weeks. Thank you. The thing about stuff like Raman and stuff is our core core expertise. So, actually, building a fiber Raman system and a seeded system is you know it's not a lot of effort. One more here. Morning. I would like just to do one question. Once you generate the broadband spectrum, yeah, then you can compress this. But my question is, you can choose the wavelength that you would like to center. The compression? In the super continuum? Do yeah. You, you, you generate the super continuum, yes. then you have the, you can choose the wavelength that you'd like to work. Yes. Yeah? yeah. But I would like to take all the energy from the broadband spectrum for a choice, one wavelength, then I would like to work now. Okay, it's possible? So, so you, you, want, you want to have all the energy in one wavelength? Yeah, something like that. Use Raman. <laughs> This. You know that, that's that's the simple answer, oh, uh, okay. and this this is this is the bit that has driven us. You know, the, just use simple fiber-based sources. Uh, you know, the supercontinuum. Of course, it has an average power of 20 watts, 
Um, but you'll, you, 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 know, you aren't going to compress that into a single wavelength. The, the way you'll compress that into a single wavelength is use that pump to pump a single discrete nonlinear process and eliminate all the rest. Uh, you know, so use RAM and, and frequency doubling. Basically, the, the things that I showed you in this sort of <coughs> second part of this talk. You know, RAM and four-wave mixing. Uh, that, that's much more, that's a more efficient approach. And commercially, it actually makes more sense as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. There's no more official questions. We can go to the coffee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.